here we are back again with another episode of the future of photography and uh, no intro today because it's still broken that's just it's what we broken. do <laughs> <laughs> technology tends to break no and you, as you can see if you're watching this it's only two of us adrian and myself yeah, hi. This this is uh, this is both nostalgic and feels <laughs> like there's two really important parts of the podcast missing. It's a very strange feeling. I'm struggling to internalize it. It's the good old days, but we we will we'll keep the boat afloat here. We'll uh, run the show. Um, yeah, the others couldn't make it today for all sorts of reasons. Um, well, uh, do you know what? Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, we can we can talk a little bit about Jeremiah's reason because he's got work on, um, and it's the work that'll get him out of the house and doing stuff. Uh, he's doing so a, that's really that's a, a pretty positive step, I think. Isn't it's, it? it's it's some something something Hollywood something <laughs> Hollywood all that Hollywood stuff that he does. Yes. except that we don't know him like that, do we? That's the really no. thing because you know I have this picture of like we 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 know we've gotten to know Jeremiah over a period of time, which is great, love him, and but we've never really met the normal Jeremiah, have we? Because we've we've only known him in these reduced circumstances that the world has put us in. So yes. um, it's great, um, great to for him to be able to get back out and about again. So. Well, anyway, he's he's got work to do. Emar has something to do, and uh, it's just the two of us. But we have an episode, nevertheless, um, that you suggested. Secret, our secret editing tips. Yeah, they're not going to remain secret for much longer. I don't That's, think. Are they? Yeah, but it's uh, yeah. So it's it's been a while. We haven't talked about. Um, you know specifics of stuff for for a while we've talked a little bit about our workflows we've talked a little bit about some of the apps that we like and things like that but but it but not so much the the usage of those things and so mm -hmm. you know i thought today it'd be good to to talk about you know some of the stuff that we look for when we are editing images and yeah. you know a little bit about you know what what you know how, how we achieve stuff and maybe also a little bit about some apps as well um and and that be um yeah that would be a, a fun conversation hopefully well from from your side it will well let me guess well i, I don't have to guess i can see it in the show notes from your side it will be mostly <laughs> no, guess, guess. <laughs> mostly on on the on the one mobile platform that is uh the one by apple um and for me um the the, the editing tips are more on the um, on the Mac and Windows yeah. because Lightroom is, in, is on both, and that's still yes. I suppose that the use. tools that you use are typically not operating system dependent, are they? They're they're not pretty really. much across all the operating systems these days. Yeah, but I'm I'm gonna show a couple of things here from uh, more from a conceptual point of view because I think that the, the things that I do. I try to, you know, I'm okay. So I'm. What I usually try to do is I try to edit in a way that I'm. I don't really fully depend on specific tools, because right. um, that means I can approach most systems and work on them. And I kind of extend this to Lightroom because for me, Lightroom is everywhere. As a photographer, yeah. whatever system I touch, uh, in a in the in a in a photography environment with other photographers lightroom is usually there because um there are others out there but lightroom is the one that is mostly there and and there's a good reason for that isn't there really it which is that you know it is the it is the the most fully most complete maybe package that, that you can go for um as somebody who's chosen uh the slightly that the path slightly less well traveled, you know, the non Adobe path. Um, there are often compromises that I need to make, and uh, you know, and and I'll very happily talk about some of those things today. Actually, you know, it's um, and certainly I could see that um, it is only because uh, I have the luxury of being an amateur photographer that I can get away with you know i, I, I <laughs> what do, i get away with i do envy you about that freedom because i often feel like there is no real way out lightroom is the only adobe product that i use at this point 
My, is that my, right? You don't my, even not not even Photoshop. No, no Photoshop. That is uh, Affinity Photo now. I do. Ah, okay. uh, mm -hmm. I use Affinity Designer, Affinity Publisher. The whole serif suite is very. Oh, very you've, good. you've completely moved over. All oh, right, okay. But there is no uh, replacement for Lightroom at this point, so unfortunately. I can't do this. I do have my issues with Adobe. They are very complete. There's a very, very powerful uh, software suite, but um, I'm I'm at least partially in the camp that I'd rather have like a copy of the software and use it and pay for it and then uh, decide when if, if I need more uh, things um, to upgrade. But yeah, and it, it's it's yeah. it's not about being cheap. It's more about owning the things that you. That you paid for because uh, with a, you with clearly a, haven't read your you if you think you own them you clearly haven't read your eulers have you <laughs> well more I, I think it is more the case than with something that is based on a subscription model so, yeah sorry yeah absolutely yes, yes and, just, uh, just and with a small print I've, I've heard of i've heard of photographers who who were i mean not right now but who were traveling for several months and then their Adobe software stopped working because it uh, they were far away from an internet connection and could Oh, is that right? Wow. The okay. Then so, there's, there's the challenge and response thing in the background, isn't that's, there? That's that's hearsay, but um, I've heard at least two or three different cases where that turned into a problem. So anyway, this is it's, uh, there's other things, um, and I had a very interesting exchange with a with an Adobe program manager, um, and I just. Got to the conclusion that, yeah, I'm I'm moving to something that works better for me. But I will use Lightroom. Oh, te teaser there, folks. Yeah. No, there's there's, there's <laughs> tune into there's... next week's episode. <laughs> no, no, not at all, not at all. Um, but you know, everyone has their reasons for using certain software or for Absolutely. not using it. So Light Lightroom, um, I'm I'm, a, I'm still a, a great fan of Lightroom. I use it. Um, I use a lot of well more than half of the features that it, that it has in different uh in different um ways and uh mm -hmm. i don't know where i would go if lightroom would disappear cuz i'm locked into this uh, ecosystem really deeply because i've i've used it for i don't even know I've used since, since since some of the early betas for, for a long time. Yes, for for the longest time, pretty much. And uh, there's ten plus years of edits in their history, oh. edit history, that kind of stuff. Yeah, for for over one hundred thousand photos. So it is. Yeah, that's it's a, a tough database one. that that that's really. That's a tough one. It's a, it's a super tough one for me. It um, is. So um, so I'm very reluctant doing what you what you're happily doing going and throw the things on, onto the iCloud and do the things in that context. So, <laughs> well, uh, I mean, we took, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about that then. Cause that's, you know, the, the, the thing that I think, cause you know, as with all of these tools, it's about what you prioritize as an individual. Right? right. And because I am an amateur photographer, I don't need to prioritize um, getting back to a non-destructive edit that I did 10 years ago. That, that's just not simply a thing for me. I don't care about that, right? If I ever need to go back and seriously rework a photo, um, or, or you know, then you know, that's, that, that I'll work directly from the raw file in oh, whatever tool I choose. By the way, I think we have to make clear um, the difference between amateur and professional is the only difference is that the professional makes money with it. Yeah, because it has no, it has nothing to do with the quality of your photography. That's a very, that's a very good point. Good clarification. Yeah, because that's uh, and and uh, it is. Um, uh, although you know, my photography, there are better photographers than I am. But the, the but Same I, here, I have by the, the way, <laughs> <laughs> I have the luxury of being an amateur photographer, which means I don't have. Uh, I, I'm not going to have a client call me up and say that shot you, you made for me. Uh, you know, uh, five years ago, I need five new treatments of it. it you know, by the end of the day, please. That that's just not something that that is ever going to happen to me. Um, so I I have some freedom of movement, and over the years, I've changed all sorts of stuff. I I'm, I really loved Aperture. Actually, um, Aperture I thought was a fantastic piece of software. It went away. I moved to Lightroom because it was the only available you know you know 
um, thing at the time that we, was anywhere close to aperture. And then I, you know, I then I got bogged down in in you know, managing Lightroom for years and having performance issues and blah blah blah, and eventually broke away from that. But the the editing thing, I mean, that for me, there are still some things that I struggle with. So so you know, trying to you know, um, <laughs> trying to haul us kicking and screaming back to the back to the show. <laughs> <laughs> I uh there there are still some things in Lightroom that I miss but um and particularly actually and this is my biggest feature request for anybody producing an app in the yeah, that that relates to photo editing um it is local adjustments there are some really, really powerful tools out there now for all platforms. Um, as you, you, you said, Chris, you know, I particularly you know, like things to work on iOS. So, so when it comes to photo editing, I tend to be choosing my tools based upon iOS first and Mac OS second. Um, and, uh, you know, although that's not exclusive, um, you know, I do sometimes do some editing directly on my MacBook, for example. You know. uh, but the... Yeah, the, of all of that, you know, sort of alternative ecosystem or, or app ecosystem, you might want to talk about. And um, that's the one thing that I, I sorely miss. Um, but you know what? There's still a lot of goodness out there. And to be honest, I don't do huge amounts of editing either because I don't find that a gratifying part of the hobby of photography. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I don't you know, yeah. so so I, I'd like to be you know minimum uh, you know I love making photographs and taking photographs and and I'm I'm less fussed about editing so actually a lot of my edits uh, are fairly minimal and it's about getting things done quickly um but you know the thing I wanted to, the the major thing I wanted to talk about today actually uh is color and and editing for color and yeah, that's this is a current thing. You know, anybody that listens to any of our podcasts for any length of time knows that I flit about, I blow with the wind, and you know, I, I, I again, luxury of being an amateur, I don't have to stick to a consistent appreciation of the hobby of photography for any length of time. I can just dabble, and that's great. Uh, but at the moment, and for the last while, a lot of what I've been really interested in is color. So I'm looking for something that can give me really good HSL edits. Um, HSL edits uh, being hue saturation and luminance uh, and you know, many photo editing tools now um, will have an ability to edit hue saturation and luminance of various different colors often they'll start with six or seven colors uh you know there'll be a uh i'll never get them in the right order so i'll just go for it there'll be a, a red an orange a yellow a green a blue no a green a turquoise or, or cyan uh, a blue and a pink or purple or something like that I, i've probably missed some there but often there'll be some range of colors like that and and that's the bit where i that's the bit where i get to work so so my my secret editing tip uh, to be true to the the the, uh, the title of the show this week um is is play with those colors um and play with those colors and the most powerful bit about that and i'm sure i've just talked about this before is is if you really want vibrant colors uh to to stand out um you the one way to do that uh is to decrease the luminance um and that for me, learning that was a really counterintuitive counter thing. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is. It's always like, I want more of this color. So I'll whack up the saturation. I'll whack up the luminance, make it brighter, right? Make it brighter and more saturated. No, no. Actually, often you don't need to touch the saturation at all. You just need to decrease the luminance and mm -hmm. all of that color comes back. And there's no, no one use case, I think, um, more effective for that than sky, right? If you want your sky to be more blue... <laughs> decrease the luminance on the sky it, it does it does help and but it's also not a general rule of thumb it does work with some colors it doesn't work well with others so but in general if, if you if you slightly underexpose then what the camera suggests uh, then you typically get a bit more saturation yes Yes, abs absolutely. Yeah, um, it's uh, yeah, it's definitely not a um, a thing that works for everything. It's, it's the same uh, thing with other things. Um, it, I used to do a lot of mixing, music mixing, and stuff. If you want something to stand out, you reduce the others, as yeah. opposed to boosting the one thing. It's very often helpful to just take away the other things. So if you want a color to stand out, um, you could 
if you if you can do local adjustments, desaturate uh, the others just slightly around it and uh, and not boost the one that will have the same effect and it will look way more natural than yeah uh, than boosting. Actually, audio mixing is a really good uh, a, a really good thing to talk about there to mention there because you know a, a, a lot of the challenge in an audio mix is is. Uh, is, is separation isn't it it's reduction because if you put everything if you whack everything up to 11 all you're going to get is white noise <laughs> yeah, especially finding... if things happen in in a similar frequency range and and uh, yeah. i'll bring this back to photography um but let's say you have a keyboard you have a singer and a guitar player and they all kind of are in the same frequency range and uh they they will step on each other's toes acoustically so um, by by moving like a guitar to the left and the keyboard to the right and giving the singer space in the middle, you 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 remove things from that equation and this way boost it the center more. Um, with um, with pictures, um, again you have a visual. You, as a photographer, you are an I would even go as far as calling you an attention manager. <laughs> right that's people, a good phrase people I like will that. watch your will look at your photography and you uh, you are you pull the shots uh when it comes to guiding the viewer's attention and the way you do this is by making certain things be more present than others and uh and guide the eye that way so um you can you can do this with uh, with local edits local edits are in general a very good secret weapon yeah yeah very very much actually and uh yeah that that is something going back to the discussion about tools that is something that lightroom does very well um has some some very powerful tools for uh for local edits and without resorting to if, if you're not using lightroom um or a you know a, a major a desktop os photo management tool i you get know, you know, like capture one or something like that um it, it that the there are fewer of the the lighter weight you know apps that are that, that include that level of power uh and that is the, that is definitely something that i miss you know even things like um uh you know, i suppose you can't get i was going to say even things like nick software which is only on the desktop but of course an earlier version of nick software we all know and love a very snapseed. well as a snapseed yeah <laughs> yes. which has the same co the same code base in it but from several generations ago so snapseed is one of the tools where you can make local adjustments um i think for me personally some of those tools in snapseed are aging a little bit now i mean that that code base could do with some further development i think um uh, but of course there's no money in it so whether it'll get any attention or not is a bit moot but the uh i think the you know it is one of the things that, that lightroom and other pro professional grade tools do do very well but you can go a long way with your hsl you know tools um yeah because you can do it may be maybe not be localized geographically but it's localized in the color spectrum <laughs> you know and often you'll be able to use a a, a a color picker to to fine tune what what it is the is the uh, actual color the actual hue that you're changing and for me that's a really big thing uh, and is a big thing about the the, the look of, of any photos that i take um and so so that that's that's kind of my one of my one of my big tips here and there are a number of ways to do it as well so so there's apps and we'll talk about a few apps in a minute um uh but the you know, uh, that you know, using apps to do that in in editing is, is one thing. Um, you, doing uh, pre-production uh, color editing uh, is also a really interesting thing for me. And I've talked about this a bit recently about about uh, using the making use of the JPEG engines uh, in your cameras and fine tuning those to give you colors that that you like uh, and give you a certain look. Um, and uh, you know, I think a lot of people. You know, uh, a lot of people don't do that, I think, possibly because they really like to work on raw files, but also because historically those JPEG engines have been a bit of a blunt instrument. Mm -hmm. um, and, and somebody who looked at raw versus JPEG 10 years ago and decided to, yeah, no, it has to be raw. Um, the, the, it's much more of a nuanced thing these days. The thing that I... I mean, what, what, what a JPEG engine does, it, it does a conversion... And uh, it does it globally on the entire photo. So, um, but this is changing. 
this is slowly changing the internals of uh, at least some smartphones and the way they treat things is that they have uh, a while ago started to treat parts of the image differently. So a uh, sky will be recognized as such and will be treated differently than a, a green meadow and a face with skin tones. Yeah. So there, there are now selective automated changes mm. in photos to bring everything together. Whereas, um, let's say, five years ago, probably, it was more of a global thing. The entire photo would be, uh, would be treated with the exact same thing. Uh, in a JPEG transformation. Yeah, it 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 is really interesting actually because you know being a Fuji camera user myself, um, uh, as you know, I get uh, a, quite a powerful JPEG engine to play with right. with lots of user settable parameters, uh, and it is amazing how quickly you can get away from, for example, really good skin tone by mucking around with it. You know, the, yes. that that the the color profiles whether they, whether your your manufacturer of choice calls them um, uh, film simulations or color profiles or whatever they call them uh, they uh, they are there's a lot of hard work that goes into creating those and and uh, doing the using the JPEG engine in the camera is uh, it's not it's not uh, just a gift that there's a penalty to pay if you go too far with <laughs> but true hey, yeah. Um, it's it's all but it, but it's all good and and again it's all about color and this is yeah this is uh this is my thing uh, uh for today as i said all about color and i suppose um you know beyond the tip of actually thinking about color and thinking about using those kinds of tools um to 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 as as a big thing in your edit um i have i have a, an educational tip here as well um and that is um i think uh, it is really very worthwhile um, investing time to learn about color and to learn about how color works uh, as complex and scientific as it is. And I know that, you know, that that's not going to be for everybody because not everybody wants to dive into the science. I wouldn't pretend to know huge amounts about the science of color. And I very quickly get lost when I start reading into it. Uh, but what I try and do is I try and have a slightly deeper appreciation of, of the tools I'm using and what does a slider actually do? You know, what is hue? What is saturation? What is luminance? And why why do things get why, why do your colors get brighter when you reduce luminance? <laughs> <laughs> understanding why that happens is is has been really useful for me and so so my education tip would be you know learn about a little bit about color um uh, the pra practically yeah, i mean you can dive in and read science papers and maths papers and things like that but practically um i would say and again this is based upon what's been really helpful for me um is investing time in learning color grading for video um, I don't know why there's so much more in the way of uh, educational resources available for, for free or, or, or chargeable uh, out there on the Internet relating to video rather than relating to uh, you know, color editing in photography and still photography. Uh, but there seem to be um, there seems to be more. At least I found more. Uh, and, you know, for me, although it is it's it's a challenge to learn these things. Um, I, I would say there, um, what would you, do you agree with that actually, Chris? Cause it'd be, cause I, I found much more educational material related to video color grading than I have related to color in photography. We, we can learn a whole lot from, from the, from the movie world on, on this front, because I mean, in, in a, in a, Typical again, Hollywood production, but any movie production, pretty much. You have two stages. You have the color correction, where everything is brought to a standard, and I would probably equate this in in our photography to getting a neutral white balance, kind of neutral colors. Yeah, and good then point. Good point. The second step is the grading part, where you where you change the colors in a way that emphasize uh, emphasize certain things that help you set a mood in the picture and I, I i often talk to people who are very adamant that they want the picture exactly as it comes out of the camera but as you know the jpeg engine is a very um very interesting beast that can be tweaked in all sorts of <laughs> uh ways so just just accepting what the camera gives you on its standard settings you're not really 
you're not really getting to the to the point where where you actively playing with the mood and looking at the at the movies and behind the scenes there's from i don't know how many years ago there's a there's a dvd extra on the matrix uh dvd i remember oh, right. where they talked about the color grading in matrix and how they changed the um like like everything that's in the matrix in the in the virtual world there doesn't have any blue there's no blue because I do remember it being quite warm and green. then when no, they're green, abs- not warm green is it go uh, go and watch it back so what you what you get is a, a is yellowish right? greenish tinge there oh, and okay. no blue and what blues what blue is daylight has a lot of blue a lot ah. of blue so they pretty much take out the the real world by ah. removing blue and it really does something subconsciously to you when you watch that movie And then the moment they pull the plug out of Neo and he is in the in the in the ship and it's it's in the real world, that's when the blue tones come in, and you can clearly see this. The moment I know, it happens, that I remember that distinctly. Remember there being a difference in in the color, yes, uh, between those two things, and that is Another color good, grading and and yes. changing that mood back and forth. And let let me show an example. I have a. Let me see if I can bring this up without. Too well, much while, while you're bringing that up, I would say I would say there's another movie actually, which um, I mean, m- many movies do this, but there's another movie that always stood out to me as uh, a good example of that, um, and that was uh, the Hurt Locker. I've uh, never heard of that. The Hurt Locker. Um, it is uh, a movie set in uh, a Middle Eastern war zone uh, about bomb disposal experts mm, okay uh and uh one of the issues they had with the coloring uh, of it is that often um warm tones are uh yeah, are, are often used uh, as we all know from our photography as well to to denote um safety and you know h- home and uh you know well-being and a happiness the cool warm fire tones. in the fireplace exactly exactly and cool tones often are used for psychologically darker subjects you know thrillers and sure. fear and you know scary stuff um, but this was a movie where all the scary stuff happened outside in blazing sunshine in a sandy environment. And so all <laughs> the warm colors meant that, yeah, it meant danger. Oh, um, that, that's uh, messing with you. And the, the, they actually had to make the safe zones, you know, the, the backup, you know, the, the people supporting back at base and stuff like that. They had to make that a cooler color palette. Um, Interesting. So they had to reverse the psychology of the color palette to reflect it. So, so the, the stuff, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm reporting something that I read some while ago, so I'm sure there are some nuances there that I've since forgotten or, or just completely got wrong. Maybe who knows? Um, but the, it, it's, uh, it, the, there's a lot to play with. Did you, did you find your example? Yes, I did. Um, ah. So here's, here's a, eh, sorry, this goes <laughs> away. Why is this? Oh, I have to. Bring it up here. Um, so this is a picture um, of a car at night in the winter. This is up in Norway. And uh, you pretty much have a, a super reduced color palette, right? There's uh, the snow being all cool and blue. And then the car's light coming at you is uh, is bright, warm, yeah. the way that car lights... Are, I mean, it 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 I mean, it's an amazing contrast to the bluish uh, surroundings of the cold snow. Yeah, it could could and, be a scene from Fargo that one. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. And it and it kind of almost came out of the camera that way. The one thing that uh, it didn't do is let me turn this off. Um, you Ooh, just saw okay, a very a subtle change, a very subtle change, and it has to do with the with the white balance of the light of the car uh, yes so yeah, yeah. so so this is a this is a local edit that i do that i love to do in these circumstances this is the only change i made to this photo is i warmed up the um the lights and let oh, me okay let me try to show you that uh, the, the problem is i, I cannot show the, you the entire lightroom because it doesn't capture well on a no, uh, 
no no I was, I was just about to ask you about that because i've talked a lot already today about using hsl tools to achieve that kind of thing um uh or to, to achieve local edits to color um i hadn't talked so much about uh white balance so um, what i what i do and this is this is my secret weapon i'm spilling my biggest secret now um <laughs> is is local white balance based okay. on the brightness of the image. So Ooh. I love giving light sources that additional little bit of warmth. Nice. And uh, what I do is I, um, I'm, I'm now I'm hovering over the picture so you can see where the mask is. I'm drawing a I mask. I can see that coming up. So, so, so you've drawn the mask on in this particular instance. I'm drawing, in this case, I've drawn the mask onto the bright parts of the picture. And then yeah. Lightroom allows you to change the white balance only on that mask. So nice. I'm I'm deliberately only warming up the bright parts of the picture. There's another tool in Lightroom that I'm uh, an enormous fan of, and that's called the luminance mask. So you could I was going to ask whether it was a luminance mask. You yeah. can use a luminance mask, and you can uh, you can tell it where um, well which which luminance which brightness level of the picture it should should yeah. be influenced by by mm -hmm. your edit and uh, in this case um this would have worked the same way but um drawing a mask yeah, so, so, well. so for those that don't know the, uh, the theory behind luminance masking what you're doing is you're making uh, you're, you're choosing a range of brightness in yes. the image and uh, and you're making edits only to that th things that are within that range of brightness and if you look at uh, some other pictures here, I mean, here's another one. Again, we are talking, oops, here we are talking about um, Norway. It's winter, it's bluish mm -hmm. in the sky, but the, 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 the lights around the houses are really warm and they make these very inviting, warm islands of light yeah, in the night. I like that night. one a lot. That's a really nice image, that, yeah. And it's it's now exactly the same thing. If I turn that off, um, it that's how it comes out of the camera. It's way more cool. It's still warm, but I want this yes. additional bit of warmth. So this is a luminance mask that only oh, okay. goes for the lights. And that, that does, again, this is, I discovered this, uh, couple of years ago and this method uh selectively changing the white balance because you know you know the um when i when i started in photography quite a while when i started in digital photography mm -hmm. there was this thing on the forums and everyone was about uh mixed light sources mixed uh, color <laughs> temperatures in a photo mm -hmm. and by all means avoid those because um the, the, there's like that's a challenge because outside the light, light coming in yeah, and yeah. inside light and artificial light and natural light and they have different uh different white balances and um no you don't want to avoid those you want to actually emphasize those that's one you know of that's, my big that's takeaways absolutely there. standard fodder now for youtube sets as well so people whose youtube channels are at some level of you know conversation or presentation you'll often see that they're they're in in the background they'll have some sort of fancy tungsten light you know which is really designed more as a, a as a, an ornament rather than to give out light you know these ones which have a spiral filament that yes. lights up just enough so that you can see the filament rather than actually to throw light um and that's yeah, that's, um, a, that's a practice so-called practical light in yes indeed yeah. yes uh, and you'll often see that they've they've that yeah that'll be kicking assuming it is actual tungsten it'll be somewhere around a 3200 kelvin light yeah. source so you know uh, uh, and they'll be lit by their standard daylight you know sort of uh, lights at 5600 Kelvin or something like that so they'll look normal because they'll be balanced for daylight and this light in the background the practical will look lovely and warm and inviting and and, and what have you so yeah that, that's a that's a, I like that there's some really good examples there good 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 secret editing tips Chris this is really <laughs> so the now now um go go and try it out if you can um what are the tools that you use Adrian well, let's talk about, uh, we were talking about the education bit. So I'm going to start with my education tip first. Um, and it's not for the faint hearted, <laughs> uh, 
but it is as far as i found for, for me personally it is absolutely the best learning tool um, and it is a little thing called da vinci resolve um, which is a name i think most of our listeners and, and viewers will, will know very well indeed uh, it is of course the uh, video editing suite uh, that is provided by black magic design who also make cameras of course and other stuff as well um now Da Vinci Resolve is uh, is two things that, for the purposes of this conversation, are really, really useful. Uh, the first is that it's enormously powerful in the way that it manages colour. Uh, the second is that it's free. <laughs> so, Which is amazing. So, I mean, it, it, it doesn't it, have the it, full it is, functionality, but um, almost the full functionality. It, it, indeed yeah so so the um it, it is very almost so so i mean this is a professional class non-linear video editor and professional class color grading and in more recent versions um professional audio editing as well um uh, all in all in one package um uh it is one of the industry standards uh, for video editing up there with Avid uh, and uh, with Final Cut Pro uh, and with Adobe uh, Premiere Pro, isn't it? It's the Adobe product. Right. I'm, um, a, I'm so, a Final Cut Pro user. Are you? Well, I, 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 yeah, I had Final Cut Pro about 20 years ago. Um, uh, but It was very days, different uh, from, from what it's now. But, uh, yes. But, but hey, you can't beat free and DaVinci Resolve is really, really good. I've seen editors work with it um and it yeah it does everything that you need it does everything and now th there's a there is a downside right so so this being my education tip um listeners and viewers you have to work for it okay <laughs> because the learning curve for davinci resolve is yeah. almost vertical <laughs> it's well it's it, that's a thing with professional tools they the more the more professional tools get they tend to get less intuitive less user-friendly they do until and, and you course, are over that hump but getting over that yeah. hump is that's the secret sticking with and it. of course the yeah the, the the yes yeah absolutely right there of course being a professional tool of course it supports many different ways people prefer to work so there are at least 25 ways of doing everything you could possibly want to do um but the the ultimate flexibility uh and control that comes when you when you've when you've you know, journeyed some way and I, I, I up that vertical learning curve. And I would say by no way am I nearly at the top. I mean, there's still huge amounts to learn, but, but going back to this thing about color editing, um, although the, although the learning curve is steep, there are an enormous number of uh, free and paid uh, educational tutorials, videos, demonstrations, courses, e everything you want um, is, is out there and you can get those on. Um, there's some great stuff for those of you who have a subscription, as I do, to on LinkedIn Learning, uh, what used to be lynda.com. Uh, there are an enormous amount of free resources on YouTube. Um, and uh, the, the one, of, one of the one of the byproducts of having everybody stuck at home for the last few years is some of these guys who are industry experts, let's say that you know, leading industry color graders, for example, um, they've turned to YouTube um, uh, to share what they know um, and to, you know, uh, as part of you know, just, I don't know, either keeping themselves sane or developing other revenue streams or whatever it might be. I right. mean, you know, there, there are some amazing people out there doing the, the, all this stuff now. Um, I mean, it's, uh, you know, so, so anybody that, you know, has dropped into Alex Soth's YouTube channel and thought, wow, how come a Magnum photographer as, you know, has got has started a YouTube channel that seemingly has no value to him other than the ability to talk at length about stuff that's on his bookshelf behind him. Um, uh, it's the same in the color grading business. There's a lot of really good people out there who, who've, who've started sharing knowledge in the last year. And so. it runs on Mac OS, it runs on Windows and on Linux even. Does it run on Linux? There's that. a download well, for Linux. Mac OS, so. Mac OS is a Linux anyway, isn't it? Sort of. Broadly speaking. Sort of. Well, it's Very a Unix broadly speaking, yes. Linux. Yeah. Um, so, so there you go. So that's my educational app, uh, my, my tip of choice. Um, and uh, then in terms of actually doing my own editing, 
Um, I would say uh, there are a number of apps uh, and these are not in any particular order, um, but just to run through them very, very quickly. Um, the first, uh, another free one, uh, or at least it's free if you if you uh, have a Mac or, or um, yes, a Mac particularly in this case, um, is Photos for Mac OS. Comes and, free on every Mac. And um, on or, the iPhone and iPad as well? It does, yes, except I've particularly chosen the Mac OS version of this because it has more editing tools. Um, yeah, and people who are. don't habitually use uh, the, yeah, this on the Mac, people who do use Lightroom, for example, may not be aware that in the last few years, Apple has really increased the number of tools available in its free uh, photo editing tool uh photos it's the photos app itself that now includes uh includes hsl stuff and other things to work with color um these are these are not available on ios but the, uh, in in the same way um the, the suite of tools on on mac os is far greater it um, is so you can get it is often a go-to for me with uh with photos that I, I, there are so many tools out there but it's become so powerful now that um if i work on stuff that i don't do in a professional context that i go to apple photos on the mac because the the tools are just yeah there's so much it's like it's like um it's like its predecessor right it's like aperture it's like aperture yeah a bit a bit <laughs> at least a bit a bit yeah i mean the the it is it is very much designed uh, to be accessible to users who have less experience of these things rather than aperture which was again a fairly steep learning curve on day one but um, you, but you go but it, you go explore and all of a sudden you find these editing tools and you find you drill down and you go oh wait a minute I can go even deeper I can uh, be very selective in what I do so Okay. Absolutely. So, so given that given that these tools, or specifically the HSL type tools, are not available uh, in Photos for iOS, I have two recommendations for iOS. Uh, the first is, is iPad only, um, and uh, but you'll recognise the brand. It's called Pixelmator Photo, and this is from the the, the people at Pixelmator. But it is an iPad only app, um, and the reason I like this one is that it has all of those hsl controls but it also has color wheels and we haven't talked about we haven't spoken about color wheels um that when you when you all get started with your vertical learning curve for davinci resolve you'll learn a lot about color wheels because about 25 of them as well, yeah. well um, the, but the pick, color wheel is a is a classical video coloring tool a classical it is and i understand it's tool. in lightroom now as well is it lightroom has color wheels too now yes yeah um, and do they? Does it have? Does Lightroom for iOS have uh, feature uh, parity? Maybe. Not sure. Maybe. <laughs> not. Not sure. I haven't. I haven't. I don't really use uh, Lightroom Mobile that much. Oh, and, okay. Uh, okay. And if I use it on the iPhone, and I haven't really used it there extensively. In no, okay, fair enough. Well, this is so. This right. one, um, Pixelmator Photo, has some great color tools. Um, again, um, it, it's uh, it is selective in the sense that, and local in the sense that you can impact various different parts of the color spectrum, um, but not geographically local edits um, that that you can get from uh, from Lightroom. Uh, one more uh, uh, in this in this world, um, which is a, a, an app called Darkroom. Um, no doubt chosen to be the opposite of Lightroom, <laughs> one might say, uh, which in itself w was chosen to be, uh, I don't know, actually, that, um, but I've always thought it was strange that they came out with something called Lightroom to replace what traditionally you would have done in a darkroom. But there you go. <laughs> the wheel turns and turns and turns. Um, darkroom is an app that works on iOS and uh, regardless of the device. So this works. It's a really powerful editor for your phone. Uh, and it works on iPad. I think it's one of these breeds now that these one this new breed of app that will work a bit on Macs as well, um, a bit like uh, Luma Fusion now does the video editing tool. Um, but uh, that's another one of my go tos. Um, Darkroom exists quite happily as an extension to iOS Photos, um, so you can just sort of you can do it without um, without working too too hard to manage your images. 
Um, and again, it has the same thing that I miss time and time again, which is the ability to do those local adjustments, uh, you know, the, the gradient adjustments or the radial adjustments or, or, or you know, whatever it is that you, you can do with, with those kinds of things. Uh, no masking in it either. So my last one, and I, been, I feel like I've been talking for ages, but hey, this is part, part of the reason we do podcasting is so that people can't stop I'll, us from talking. So I'll that's cut good. you off if it's too much. It's okay still. <laughs> <laughs> Clock yes, is ticking. Boss. Okay. All right. Um, last one then. Uh, and this is an app that we have talked about on this show again before. It's called Polar. Um, uh, Polar with a, with a double R. Um, this is an app that works on iOS. And it does include the ability to do geographically local adjustments. It yeah. can do gradients. It can do linear gradients. It can do radial gradients. It can do other types of things as well. And it does, this has free versions and paid versions. And even the free version can do a lot of this stuff. Um, so, so for anybody that is wanting to do you know, those kind of selective edits to their images, um, Polar is a great app as well. And with that, I, th I think that's that. That's all the all the tips, editing tips, and app tips, and things like that, and educational tips that I've prepared to share today. Very cool. I'm, um, uh, yeah. I think, I think I'll, 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 I'll at least have to look at Darkroom because that hasn't really crossed my cro crossed my my landscape it yet. It, it is a good one. Now, yeah. I, I've been using Darkroom for some time and they've changed their, their business model in, in uh, more recently. Um, I think they are now more strongly encouraging subscription rather than I outright see. purchase. Now, I bought the pro version of Darkroom some time ago before they went to subscription and they grandfathered everybody in. Oh, I see. Um, uh, so I, I don't know at the moment, actually. I don't know if you can still buy it outright. It might be a subscription. <coughs> Excuse me. So with that, I hope that everyone got some interesting uh, interesting secret editing tips out of this. Um, let's go to the picks of the week. What do we have? Yeah, good point. And thank you for covering up from my slightly tickly cough <laughs> that I just had there. <laughs> let, me, let me kick this off um, because you've been talking about I can't way too hide long. that on video, you see. So. <laughs> Um, so there is this, let me, let's see if I can open this in a bigger window. Um, no, I can't. Um, this is, this is a little, a little fun thing I recently came across when, um, I talked to someone about digitizing analog photos, film, Ooh, okay, and, uh, slides especially, and, uh, I've I've recently found like or no, I didn't find my parents found when they cleared out the basement they found like 250 old slides and it was like a little collection of things and I had them scanned by a service cuz I couldn't be bothered <laughs> doing it that's a but big job yeah yeah what I would typically do is um I would take a photo of them with a macro lens with a little copy stand with an led light source under it do some color correction i mean it, it gets very advanced and um and the results are very very good when using a camera to do this if the camera is good and if you do it right um but of course it's a lot of manual stuff and you have to put the slides in and out it's faster than scanning but it takes a bit of cleaning up in the end um, you do need a decent lens for that as well if you're and doing you need that a for decent slides, macro lens. the, sli the so, slides are tiny, aren't they? I someone, mean, I've done this before with negatives from my pinhole camera, but that's a 6x12 negative, so you don't really need a macro lens for a 6x12 negative. Very true. So so the whole handling part of it, uh, someone has uh, built something that makes this uh, easier, and it is uh, this contraption um, in the video, you, you see a robot arm, probably very <laughs> expensive robot arm, wow. taking a slide, holding it as you would <laughs> hold it, it on top of an LED source, trips a camera shutter, and then uh, serves itself the next slide, holds it in front of the lens. <laughs> NVIDIA just do that for fun, don't they, really? Um, I think it is uh, something that... 
if you have a robot, why not? Um, if you don't, then it's probably <laughs> a manual thing to do. I found this very amusing to watch. So, uh, your picks. Of- we should, that prompts me, actually, while you're calling out my picks. At some point, we should have a discussion of, of NVIDIA trying to buy ARM. Of what that might mean for the future of photography. I know that that's a way big topic just to drop in at the end of a particular episode. That's a whole topic in itself. But I am I'm following this. Yes, I am. Yeah, more to come on that one. I think. Yes. Uh, or but we should be following that and, and see. Yeah, you because know, uh, as we often follow Nvidia um, because of their their work in AI and stuff like that. But um, buying ARM, wow, that's a big thing. Anyway, sorry. My pick of the week. Yes. Uh, well, I have two pick of the week, two picks of the weeks. One, one of them actually, uh, we got a little bit excited about, and I spoke about too quickly in the middle of the podcast, and that is DaVinci Resolve. Um, I am absolutely uh, an advocate for, for this tool, even though I don't use it for anything professional. I do edit my own home family movies in it, um, and on my recent vacation, I was shooting, uh, a shooting for a family video, and I I will be editing that in in Resolve over coming time. Um, you know the ability to do yeah to to mix sources of video you know from a phone and a, and a dedicated camera and work out you know log stuff and color it and edit it and and play with the sound on it and all it also has tool. lots of it's, transitions uh, and things in it so I I, I fully expect yeah, it to yeah. become like a, an early desktop publishing result with all the bells and whistles in it and everything's moving and blinking and. Yes, c- certainly um, <laughs> any weaknesses in the finished family movie will be weaknesses that come from me rather than from the tool sets <laughs> that I choose to use. <laughs> uh. um, my second one goes right back to, uh, my second pick of the week goes goes right back to the beginning of the image making process. We talked briefly about uh, JPEG engines earlier on and uh, recommending it again, because I know this isn't the first time I've recommended this, uh, fujixweekly.com. And the film simulation recipes uh, that they provide. I've been playing around a bit. I think last time we talked about this, I was using mostly the Kodachrome simulation, and I admit. Um, and at the moment, I'm shooting a lot of portrait at 400. <laughs> Not actual Portra 400, of course, but the the recipe that they put in for Portra 400. Um, I tried the I tried programming into my camera the 160 and the 400, um, and uh, it turns out that the 400, to my eye, was much more pleasing. That the the 160 mm. was a bit strange, actually. Well, Portra um, 400 so is is a beautiful film. A very it is, uh, and lovely. very much more neutral compared to Kodachrome, which has oh, yes. its own <laughs> yes, scheme. Sure. So. So, uh, you know, um, g- gives me opportunities to, you know, to, to play with things as I shoot. So, so the, those are, uh, those are my two, uh, picks of the week. All right. And with that, we have reached the end of the episode again, intros and outros are broken this week, but, um, that uh, won't stop me to point you to our website with all the other episodes of the podcast, thefutureofphotography.com. We're on Twitter at TFOBNow. We're on Instagram at TFOBNow. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. And with that, yeah. everyone, have a good one. And um, let's see how many we are next time. <laughs> Until <laughs> Take then. Care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.